let's uh <laughs> that was a extreme detour from uh, where we were at but let's get back to it's it like a business only instead of being controlled by the boss's boss's boss it is controlled democratically by the workers themselves every co-op has a constitution or rather a set of bylaws that everyone follows while each co-op has different bylaws they all have similarities they might say something like this a cooperative worker is also known as a member each member gets some share of the co-op's profit and each member gets equal voting power when making decisions. Well, sort of. The issue with voting on every little decision is that there are so many to be made that it requires hours of meetings every day, leaving no time to actually do the things your co-op wants to do. So most cooperatives elect a board of directors to make some kinds of decisions, usually ones necessary for the co-op to operate, while other decisions still must be made democratically by all members, usually bigger picture decisions like modifying the bylaws, accepting new members, or electing board members. Elections are held regularly so that any board member who abuses their power or otherwise runs things badly will be voted out. You and your coworkers can fire your boss. Imagine that. There's tons more to the bylaws, addressing things like the process behind board meetings, member meetings, decisions without meetings, consensus and voting, and how people get paid. Worker co-ops have an average pay ratio of 5 to 1. That means the highest earner makes 5 times more than the lowest earner. Compare that to traditional businesses with an average pay ratio of 320 to 1. One this could make the case that people who take on more responsibility should be rewarded for it. But to what extent? Is anyone's time really worth 300 times more than mine? In worker cooperatives, we the people have real power in deciding what that ratio should be. In the United States, there are over 18 million businesses, and out of those, only about 500 are worker-owned and democratically run. One reason there are so few co-ops is that it's difficult for them to outcompete traditional businesses, since co-ops tend to pay their workers more, offer more benefits, uphold a healthy work environment, and pay members for attending meetings, they tend to have to raise their prices to stay afloat. These prices don't compete well with traditional businesses, whose prices are low because their workers aren't treated well. But despite this, some co-ops survive anyway. Some have found untapped markets where competition hasn't set in. Some are in areas where people want to and are able to spend more to support co-ops. Some co-ops have made compromises to their democracy by hiring workers who aren't members. They can't vote, don't get any shares of the co-op, and are at the full mercy of the members and the board. Well, that kind of Under defeats the, the purpose. economic system, the more democratic co-ops generally are at a disadvantage. So do cooperatives stand a chance? My answer to this question is, I don't know. But it's worth exploring the possibility. Cooperatives are more resilient in areas where there are other cooperatives and low unemployment, because in those areas, traditional businesses tend to lose employees. But it's hard to start a lot of cooperatives at once, let alone start just one. But if we could reach a point where co-ops dominated, they would have some serious revolutionary potential. If co-ops become diverse enough in their production, it's possible that they could network together and make coordinated decisions. Each co-op in a given area could elect a representative to have meetings about what each co-op needs and what surpluses are available, and decide how to distribute them. Each co-op could get their production materials from another without relying on money. There's no reason I kind to of stop wonder. There. The network of co-ops could also start directly... I kind of wonder at what point that kind of uh, activity would start to brush up against like collusion laws. It's a, it's a curious question because a uh, cooperative doesn't quite function the, the same way that a private owned, privately owned business does, but there are laws uh, that outlaw certain types of collusion within an industry. Like you see this co-op here has a shoe icon and the other one has a hammer. Like those aren't competitors in any sort of way. Someone's selling shoe and someone's selling a hammer. So it's possible that they can have um functioning uh operations with one another and be able to you know meet and coordinate on cooperative based functions without it you know running afoul of some collusion laws but i imagine that uh working that way within an industry could probably get you into some trouble that's something to look into though. distributing goods to its members diminishing their need for money after all what good is money if your needs are being provided for as people rely on money less and less, traditional businesses would get weaker and weaker. Cooperatives would take their place, one by one, until all of society's productive forces are worker-owned, democratically operated, and oriented not around profit, but around the betterment of humanity. We have a lot of work to do if we want to make this vision a reality. And different people have different roles to play. If you don't have the means by which to start a co-op, you can try to find an existing one to join. Or if there aren't any around, Start conversations about the concept. 
If you know a lot of people and are highly connected with your local community and you're privileged enough to have the time, you might be able to pull together resources to start one. If you're a business owner, you can transition your business into a cooperative. Finding a craft that can also support other cooperatives helps to form the very beginnings of a mutually supportive network that could become the new organizational basis for all production. Thank you for watching this video. I do not run ads and You're I never welcome. will. So if you want to support me, you can do so on Patreon. Thank you for the video. If you've been following this channel for a little while, you are probably aware of my perspective on capitalism in the United States. With effectively unchecked power, corporations have reached their insidious tentacles into each and every corner of society. Without tearing everything down and replacing the capitalist economic framework entirely with a more humane and egalitarian one, is it even possible to efficiently produce and distribute goods or services in a way that's fair to the people on the payroll? The workers putting in their time and energy from 9 to 5. Is it possible to have a democratic workplace that puts real power in the hands of those who provide the labor? As it turns out, yes, there is a setup that can not only compete, but offer exceptional service and democratic working conditions. It's called a worker co-op. To make this happen, rather than being run by a single owner or CEO, co-ops are controlled democratically. Each member gets a vote, either for the explicit determination of operational structures and how they are treated, or for the election of a board of directors to do the same. What's more, the workers themselves collectively own the company. This system is very flexible and can be used for any type of business from taxi drivers to web developers. They are the quintessential social enterprise, putting collective good above personal gains, often operating as nonprofits to guarantee near absolute freedom from executive greed. Co-op members often find themselves possessing a level of dignity and quality of life unattainable by traditional employees, along with high job stability and opportunities to develop new skills. And membership is open to anyone willing to accept certain responsibilities, regardless of discrimination they may face elsewhere. On top of all this, worker co-ops can be more stable than profit-driven corporations, reliably staying afloat in times of economic turmoil, which have become worryingly common in recent years. You never see a cooperative bank needing to be bailed out with taxpayer money, because they don't have to undertake risky financial endeavors in a never-ending quest to maximize profit. Instead, they simply exist as a safety net for normal people, providing loans and credit at reasonable rates so those with savings can indirectly help their neighbors without, thus addressing economic inequality in poor neighborhoods. I believe While I'm the a member to number one of, of currently existing co-ops in the U.S. is fairly small, the democratic workplace model has been continually rising in popularity over the decades, especially in recent years as traditional employment has become less stable, financially feasible, and pleasant. By pooling people's expertise, starting a worker co-op can be easier than starting a typical business. And they've been pretty successful, too. More than just staying out of the red, the average American cooperative makes a 6.4% profit without sacrificing sustainability. As you might expect, these co-ops are far more commonplace outside the states, most notably in Italy and Spain. In fact, the seventh largest company in Spain is a worker cooperative. Let's put things into perspective with a specific example, Ocean Spray. If you've ever shopped for groceries at a supermarket in the US, odds are you've seen their products sitting on store shelves in the juice or canned fruit aisles. They're arguably the most recognizable cranberry brand in the country, and they were the very first to produce cranberry juice commercially back in the 1930s. It's somewhat ironic that the biggest name in cranberries, a quintessentially American fruit native to the continent and a mainstay of the traditional Thanksgiving dinner, foregoes participation in the equally American practice of employee exploitation. But just how well have they managed? Far from being unable to grow big enough to stand against the corporate competition, Ocean Spray has flourished. Today, they're the largest producer of cranberries in the world, with over a billion dollars in annual sales. Yet all this financial success has not compromised their commitment to fair compensation. The full 100% of all profits the business generates are distributed right back to the farmers. No shareholder dividends necessary. And cranberry farmers especially deserve the metaphorical fruits of their labors. That's a given shit that ton the of wolf cranberries. spiders often used as natural pest control end up crawling all over their bodies whenever they flood the bog for harvesting. Let's take another example. The fuck? When my Wait, wife what? And I moved to our current home, Jesus Christ! We were what the to fuck? What nightmare of fuel was that? Cooperative. We're always excited to support democratic operation. The metaphorical fruits of their labors, given that Jesus the wolf Christ. spiders, often used as natural pest control, end up crawling all over their bodies whenever they flood the bog for harvesting. <laughs> Let's take another that's example. that's what they don't tell you about worker-owned co-ops. Is yeah, they're great for employees, but uh. Side note, uh, you're going to have to let spiders crawl all over your bodies if you really want to get to that paycheck. Uh, that's, that's, that's the dark side of uh, worker-owned co-ops. They bury that in the fine print, you know, having spiders crawl all over your body. 
When my wife and I moved to our current home, we were surprised to see that we could get our electricity through a worker cooperative. We're always excited to support democratic operations, so we signed up. United Cooperative Services, founded in 1938, has been serving Texans for decades and now represents over 62,000 oh, people in, in 14 Texas? counties. As a worker co-op, United is not a privately owned company. I look it this... doesn't have wealthy share. I should look this company up. Cooperative. We're always excited to support democratic operations, so we signed up. United Cooperative Services, founded in 1938, has been serving Texans for decades and now represents over 62,000 people in 14 counties. As a worker co-op, United is not a privately owned company. It doesn't have wealthy shareholders or investors to placate. Instead, it's a nonprofit and owned by the workers and consumers it serves. That means there's no predatory profit motive, workers get paid fairly, and any profits get reimbursed to consumers or are spent on projects to improve the lives of everyone involved with the company. For example, instead of lining the pockets of some billionaire executive, United spent excess money to build a network of solar panels so they could offer renewable energy to consumers at a lower price than traditional energy companies. But the benefits don't stop there. Every United Co-op employee is entitled to a vote in board of directors elections, as are all of the consumers who get their electricity from United. Leadership is democratically elected and held accountable to ensure that both workers and customers enjoy the benefits of a more representative operation. That's the thing that really stands out about worker co-ops. The fact that they're not driven by a profit motive, but simply by the goal to provide their workers and customers with the service their business offers. United Cooperative provides electricity. It looks like this, they spray, only provide uh, this is services slight south of Fort Worth, unfortunately for me. Okay, so that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that said a lot of the same stuff as the other one, but I'm actually curious about what this guy says because he claims to have started one, and I think he goes starting a co-op. I'm excited up to and down and the process as he experienced it. Cooperative. If you're like me and been thinking about starting a co-op for a while, hopefully this video and the series of videos will be helpful and answer questions and concerns, and you can see the ups and downs. My biggest question about it, really, honestly, is and like the funding the aspect because, of it. Uh, I so I think to you know make it more clear how I got to the concept of worker-owned cooperatives, um, I need to go back to the beginning. So for me, it started off with this idea of thinking about Jeff Bezos' worth. At the time, he was worth like $115, $120 billion. And I was like, oh, man, that's like a ton of money. And just what would happen to the world if all that money went to charities? Um, it was just a, just an idea. I was just thinking about it. And I was this dude was high as fuck. I thought I actually had an solution. Oh, dude. What if, like, like, it all went you know, to charities? Business, charities um, or you can just tax the motherfucker. I, I really started thinking into that. Uh, Mike is super sensitive today. What was possible, what was impossible of the company Newman's Own. Newman's Own. I love Newman's Own. For almost 40 years now. So, um, as I was doing more and more research, Newman's Own makes delicious uh, salad dressing. I'm not quite certain uh, that it got me so excited. Stuff like. Um, or democratic workplaces, uh, more equal pay, uh, product focus over financial focus. And when I started seeing all these pieces- I like how he just kind of glossed over protection for workers. While, <laughs> co -ops, so while there's definitely a lot of co-ops in the US and abroad, finding clear information on how to start a worker co-op was definitely challenging. Um, I had to dig through lots of different sites and uh, watch different videos. There was some high level material, but not really detailed steps how to do it. Um, and so for me, this was a, a real challenging point. If you want to sort of find information on a, how to start a traditional startup, there's so many blog pieces, so many um, influencers, so much uh, uh, videos on that concept. But for worker and cooperatives, it's really hard to find um, sources that you can count on and are clear to be able to share exactly the process of starting a worker and cooperative and, and how to be successful at it. But slowly but surely, I was able to start putting, piecing together some information. Uh, as cooperatives stand for being cooperative, I was able to also talk to uh, different founders and entrepreneurs across the globe. There's different organization nonprofits that support the education and teaching people how to start worker and cooperatives. And slowly, I started getting a better idea how to start one. Um, and in that process, I realized that there was really three main challenges to starting a, a worker on cooperative. The first challenge is trying to get people to come together around an idea uh, or around a problem to solve. So that was the first major hurdle. Second one 
was governance. And this is the one I'm worried an organization about. Organization that was democratic, but not bureaucratic. And lastly, a worker-owned cooperative, um, as you may know, cannot get money from traditional investors. Uh, otherwise, they'd be owned by investors, not by the workers. So, uh, so in that situation, you have to figure out a different way to raise money. And that has a, been a challenging process to figure out how to do that. In retrospect, there was a lot of things I, I learned about this process. Um, first off, institute.coop uh, online is a great resource for information on how to start one. Uh, they have a PDF, I'll, I'll link that in the description below, of actually literally how to start a co-op. Uh, additionally, I reached out to uh, nonprofit organizations in my city, which is New York, but there's ones all over the country. I even reached out to one in the Northwest, I think. Uh, it was just a phone number I found, and I reached out to them, and they were, and they were very helpful. I also contacted a bunch of um, entrepreneurs, um, both in the U.S. and beyond, uh, who started working on co-ops and got their feedback. And, and people were so helpful across the board, always willing to spend some time, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, more, uh, give me input on how to start a work around co-op. Because there's not as much you know, blog content and video content out there um, for entrepreneurs interested in starting There really isn't. I noticed that searching for these videos. Spending a little bit of time doing that type of research, doing that type of reading uh, to get yourself knowledgeable how to start one. So yeah, he answered a couple of questions. What he really did though, what this video really highlighted for me was some kind of, it was kind of a confirmation of uh, an issue that I knew exist, existed with um, resources available to people who want to start worker-owned co-ops and a potential idea I had to solve that problem. If you've been engaged in democratic politics to any degree uh, in the past, 10, 15 years, uh, you're probably familiar with Act Blue. And what Act Blue is, it's a, it's, a, it's a site that basically functions as a fundraising uh, hub for left of center candidates um, and initiatives. It can, it can also uh, fundraise for initiatives too. Uh, it's wildly successful. It's the only, it, it really put uh, Democratic candidates and left of center candidates in a position to be able to compete money-wise with big money donors and super PACs and all of that sort of stuff that usually, conventionally, would support either the worst corporatist Democrats or, or Republicans. Honestly, it was just a tool for Republicans. And Act Blue made it so that Democrats could actually compete on a closer to fair level with Republicans. And, you know, the left has since used it also to be able to compete with corporate Democrats. Uh, AOC, Bernie Sanders, very prolific uses of, uh, of, of Act Blue throughout their campaigns, in addition to all of their other different fundraising methods. Act Blue is really good at being like a centralized location that people of a like political mind trust. They make the donation process easy. It's, it's, a, it's a really effective tool for being able to uh, basically identify campaigns and candidates and whatnot, identify where their best sources of income, uh, of revenue can come from and then target them in a very streamlined manner uh, and then just have a really focused fundraising campaign. And I was thinking like, it would be neat if there was something like Act Blue, but instead of funding campaigns or candidates, it was it was it just funded uh, worker-owned co-ops. It funded seeding uh, uh, worker-owned co-ops. Co-ops would basically live in place of a venture capital firm or you know a private big big money investor, and they would dole this money out. I don't see it being put out as like a loan or anything that would need to be paid back. But there would have to be a very there would have to be a, a process for which there is some kind of accountability that can be had for this money once it's delivered to a co-op. So I, I feel like whatever this this, this site exists as. Uh, should definitely have all the information that this guy said he had a hard time finding. Like, there should be a very detailed step-by-step -step process on everything that you need to do in order to build a co-op from the ground up. Um, there should be templates for what bylaws look like, uh, multiple templates, because uh, you know there is no one-size-fits-all solution for that. 
you can base it off of existing uh, co-op companies. So if you want to do a co-op bank, you can find some bylaws from existing co-op co-op banks out there. Use those as templates. Uh, grocery stores, you can find some for grocery stores. Use those as templates, etc. Just a shit ton of resources available uh, with like a step-by-step -step, like checklist of the, here's the things you need to do. Here's the things you need to have in place. Here's how to run these uh, elections within your co-op. Here's how to vote on things and how to tally the votes. These are the best tools to use in order to, you know, track this stuff and store it, you know, locally or on the cloud if you want to do that. And all these kinds of resources that would help make it super easy for someone who wants to go down that road to figure out, okay, it's not, it's not, like the process may be more involved than, you know, going and filing a DBA for your own LLC or whatever. Um, a little bit more involved than that, but you have this step-by-step -step guide that helps uh, helps us walk through each point in the process that'll help us out that'll help make this as easy as it could possibly be and so you know you have those resources and whatnot available on this site and I guess once you get to a certain point where you have codified your founding uh, your your founding uh, members uh, and you had your election um, you had your votes and whatnot, and you have the people who have been voted as, you know, the CEO or whatever positions you're going to have there. Um, once you have all the paperwork, the re uh, requisite paperwork and signatures on agreements and whatnot uh, signed and established and sent to this hub, you'll have to make a money request. They can go over your paperwork, maybe give you a phone call or a Zoom call, whatever, chat with your team, your group, if they feel that's necessary. Uh, yeah, and then like out of the money that they fundraise, they can just issue you that money. Like, here you go. Here's your seed money. Ostensibly, that would be the end of it. I wouldn't even think it would have to be anything like, oh, you got to pay us this back because it's not a bank giving a loan. Uh, the other side of this is the money that they have that they would be giving out to these organizations would all have to be fundraised. So much in the same way that they're doing fundraising for political campaigns, you would have fundraisers for, you know, just the ongoing campaign of seeding uh, worker-owned co-ops. And I'm sure that you would have uh, some buy-in from some of your big-ticket fundraisers out there, your AOCs and Bernie Sanders and whatnot. Anyone that actually believes in the cause would probably be willing to help raise some money for it, uh, in addition to a uh, benefactor, whatever you want to call them, that just might want to donate money to the cause without understanding that it is a donation. There is no return on investment on like you're donating to this cause uh who maybe jeff bezos his ex-wife and want to toss a couple a couple uh hundred million in there but whatever the case may be however that money gets raised and you know i i envision this company itself being a worker-owned co-op so they probably won't have an unethical uh, manner in which they would raise the money but whatever methods they use to raise the money they would use that money then to uh, go through the process of seeding it out to worker-owned applicants uh, as they, you know, file in. It's probably a little bit more centralized uh, than I think you'd want it to be, but considering where we're at right now in this process, you know, fi only 500 worker-owned co-ops in a country that has tens of millions of businesses, or whatever that number was he said, uh, like this is just the way it's going to have to be to get, to get it off the ground. And the reason why I think it's important to do this in the game industry is because I think that the game industry is a high-profile, cutting-edge industry that a lot of young people pay attention to. And it gets a lot of news. Uh, it gets a lot of coverage. Mostly for bad reasons, but for good reasons, too. You know, it gets a lot of coverage when there's a new Xbox or PlayStation that's on the shelves or selling out before people can buy it. There's a new Switch and all the people in the old folks' home are using it to, like, work out or whatever. With all the stories that you saw in the news over the Wii, how good the Wii was for old people. You know, there's a lot of stories in the news about games, uh, gaming, and it is seen as, like, a cutting edge and exciting field to get into. You know, were it not for the constant stories about crunch and worker abuse and shitty pay and, and sexual assault and all of that sort of stuff. Um... But I think that in the game industry, you could probably peel off a lot of people who, you know, like I mentioned in my prior video, you're either going to get laid off or are tired of getting shit on for one reason or another. And, you know, they're going to start their own game studio anyways. I mean, that's just modus operandi in the game industry. You work at a game company until you can start your own game company. And that's just, that's just the thing. Um, 
if that's going to be the case anyways, then there should be a strong concerted push to make sure that as many of those new game companies as possible get started as a worker-owned co-op. And then as, they, as more and more of them start, start to blossom and grow and start to pull more people in, hopefully more of them start to pull talent away from the bigger companies. They start having to compete for labor with these worker-owned co-ops, which, you know, it could call, this, that's the interesting thing. One of the issues in the prior video we watched that he talked about with respect to co-ops competing with conventional business is that because the co-ops don't crush their labor with, you know, city pay and all that, they are, their goods tend to be more expensive uh, than the goods that are provided by a traditional corporation that, you know, undercut labor. And then, you know, they, those savings get passed on through the cost of the product. I guess true in a lot of ways. Uh, that can be true in a lot of ways. I don't know how that translates into video games, though. The way it already translates into now, as far as big companies versus small companies, just that big companies have a capacity to make those AAA blockbuster games, uh, those multi, multi million dollar games that take like three or four years to develop. A uh, larger company has the pro has the ability to kind of seed the funding for that throughout the process of develop um, throughout the pipeline of development. For a smaller company, really can't. Uh, they end up having to take on mercenary work just to keep themselves afloat while they uh, build out their pet project. So in that regard, I guess it would make a co it would make it harder for a co-op to be able to um, fund a bigger project, bigger products, uh, up until I guess they reached a certain certain size and capability to do that. But if you're talking about just in terms of Putting a product on the shelf and selling it the tools for developing games like it's kind of like an equal there's, an, there's kind of like an equalizer there it's not like it's not exactly i don't know if i could make a good analogy on this but it's not exactly like like you know shoes where you could buy like a 200 hundred dollar pair of like you know nikes or adidas or whatever and you can feel like oh okay there's some real quality in this shoe. I can walk for like an hour and my my feet don't hurt. And you know, it looks cool on top of it. And then you turn around and you buy like a $20 pair of shoes. Like, my feet hurt like shit. And I, all I did was put them on and stand up in them. And you know, like the soles are already starting to fall off. Like you could see a difference. Like you get what you pay for, right? But... Game development, with the tools being what they are and how simple it is to like download them and learn them and and just the wealth of information and knowledge that people are sharing uh, about the process um, top to bottom, like as far as graphics are concerned, as far as artistry and music and all this sort of stuff, everything that it takes to, to develop a game, it's all out there on the internet uh, in one capacity or another. Like, I don't know if the difference would be as great as like those two shoes between a game that's made by Epic Games and a game that's made by you know, a studio of 12 people you know, working somewhere in the middle of Texas. Um, again, like the size and scope probably will be affected just by you know, the size of the team and what they have available to them as far as manpower and time. But like, you know, I mean, uh, you can have a game that seems deep seems like it's it's a bigger game than it actually is based squarely off of off off of uh the craft the craftsmanship and the artistry that goes into the game firewatch i think is a pretty good example of a game like that by campo santo a indie game by an indie studio although i think they were purchased by a, by a larger company which is a bummer that i think that the equalization of the uh tools tools and techniques that are available to developers kind of eliminates that at least some of that gap between the products that those different types of companies put out so i think that 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 having that be an existing factor in you know, game development studios moving to co-ops i think that works in the co-ops benefit like why wouldn't you like if you're gonna output something that's not terribly of uh, different quality why wouldn't you do it? You know what? Like the video said, there are a bunch of uh, co-ops that can you know, work together and 
game studios can co-develop together, then why can't co-op game studios, why can't they co-develop together? You have a number of co-op developers working on the next noxiously trendy Battle Royale game. Apple Santo is an American video game developer based in Bellevue, Washington, founded in Blah, 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 blah. Ah, in April 2018, the company was acquired by Valve. Ah, Valve, the sons of bitches. Valve is like, they live on the other end of the spectrum, I think. I think that company is like a purely libertarian-run company. I remember uh, when I was working at BioWare, uh, one of the guys on my team was a hardcore Texas libertarian, of course. Of course he was. Uh, and he had like like all of the different flags of Texas up over his head and his desk and he's a cool dude actually i like talking to him a lot we used to get into really good debates and discussions about economics and whatnot and he he was um he was he always had fun talking with me about it and you know i had fun talking to him and he was like man you should uh he was like trying to recruit me he was like you should uh come uh be a part of the uh williamson county libertarian party you can do x y or z or whatever i'm like sorry bro you're asking the wrong dude here like i am uh like at that time, I, I hadn't quite jumped over into the full socialist spectrum, but you know, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm the polar opposite of you, buddy. I am a full-throated progressive, dude. I am, I am, I am left of the spectrum and have nothing but, let's face it, disdain for libertarianism, or at least uh, anarcho-capitalistic libertarianism, which I got the vibe is uh, Valve's whole thing. Like when I was working there. What went around the office for a little while was um, Valve's Worker Handbook, and they're like their their new hire handbook or whatever it is, employee handbook, um, and it was all about like uh, it was all about how like there was uh, it was very it was very anarch anarchistic I guess in a way I guess I shouldn't say libertarian I guess I should say it was more anarchistic they had a very flat structure. Um, they didn't really have they didn't they didn't really have um a hierarchy there was no real hierarchy and there wasn't any real edicts from on high i think like people just kind of did whatever they whatever the fuck they wanted to do really valve corporation valve software blah blah, blah founded in 1996 before former microsoft employees gabe newell and mike harrington valve uses a flat structure whereby employees decide what to work on themselves they develop games through play testing and iteration Describing ga uh, game design as kind of experimental psychology. Most of Valve's revenue comes from Steam, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so they just kind of touched on it a little bit there. Maybe they have a company structure. Initially, Valve used a hierarchical structure more typical of other development firms, driven by the nature of physical game releases through uh, publishers that required tasks to be completed by deadlines. However, as Valve became its own publisher via Steam, it found the hierarchical structure was hindering the process. After ha completing Half-Life 2, Valve, tradition, uh, Valve transitioned to a looser, flat structure. Outside of executive management, Valve does not have bosses. It uses an open allocation system. This approach allows employees to work on whatever interests them, but requires them to take ownership of their product and mistakes they uh, may make, according to Newell. Newell recognized that this structure works well for some, but that, quote, there are plenty of great developers for whom this is a terrible place to work. Although Valve has no bosses, some employees hold more influence due to seniority or relationships. De facto project leads become, quote, centralized conduits for organization and sharing information, and decisions are made collectively. Valve uses an, quote, overwatch eh, process to gather feedback from senior members, uh, which teams may use or ignore. The lack of organization structure has led to project cancellations, as it can be difficult to convince other employees to work on them. In 2020, Valve acknowledged that the structure had made it difficult to gather momentum, slowing their output during the 2010s. The VR projects and Half-Life Alex became a turning point, setting studio-wide short-term goals to focus the company. According to Walker, we had sort of a collective uh, we had to sort of collectively admit we were wrong on the premise that you will be happiest if you work on something you personally want to work on the most. So okay, they kind of sort of yeah, that's definitely libertarian like. I mean, it's it's well, it's I guess it could be libertarian, but it could also be uh it, it could also be like you know, some form of uh, anarcho-communistic too, like 
there is no hierarchy there are no bosses you just kind of do what you want to do but at the end of the day they found that they couldn't pull in the same direction uh long enough to actually you know generate a product um you know i guess this speaks this kind of goes into more of a philosophical discussion on what the uh purpose of of a valve isn't a co-op valve is just a regular company what the purpose of a co-op is versus what the purpose of a company is versus what the purpose of these things should be in an ideal society um some of the criticism of worker-owned co-ops is that they do still exist in a capitalist framework uh which to that end it serves the purpose of generating a product you're in competition with other people in a market to generate a product to to sell that product and blah 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 um which i don't you know i think the people that kind of hold fast to that criticism are people that are more in of the view that we should have a more revolutionary approach towards overthrowing traditional capitalism in exchange for instituting something closer to like a utopian communist view uh, which i don't subscribe to i think that utopianism has its place in kind of establishing a goal to work towards with the recognition that you're never going to get there but knowing that placing making those steps towards it if you're doing it you know democratically earnestly and for the benefit of greater society and not for the benefit of private profits you work towards those utopianistic goals you can put the frameworks into place to build a society that is more equitable that is more um uh, diverse to build a society that is in and of itself building towards something that yeah is, uto uh, is utopian you're not going to get to that but it's constantly improving it's constantly recognizing its faults it's recognizing whatever mistakes it made in, in prior iterations and it's constantly building and improving on that that's something that our society stopped doing a while ago i, I don't know when that when we stopped doing that uh, if i was going to venture a guess i would probably say around the civil rights era like once we decided that you know black people weren't animals that you shove into a pit and sick dogs on them people were like all right this progress thing's gone on far enough we ain't gonna have this progress no more no not in my town we gotta stop it we gotta go right back to the way it was and it really has been speeding back to quote unquote the way that it was uh pretty much since jimmy carter not to diss that guy that guy is um since his presidency the guy is you know eligible for sainthood his presidency uh, wasn't all that spectacular. Had some ups for certain. Uh, he was he was definitely a he was a good, well-meaning dude who had the environment on his mind. For certain, but he was also the he was also the granddaddy of the era of deregulation. He was the one that ushered it in when he deregulated the airline industry and elements of the credit card industry. That's really when it all went to shit. Reagan came in and just hit the hit the gas on all of that and we've been a regressive society pretty much ever since and you know only recently have we realized the error of that and have started trying to claw our way at least back to where we were yeah, say around the 60s you know um we're trying to get a tax rate for the wealthiest people that's comparable to like the 60s actually what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it comparable to what it was in obama's era which you know was dog shit even then like we need to claw it back to something a little bit more intense especially if we're going to try to fix the problems that we're all trying to solve but that's the thing like if we want to fix the problems we want to solve then we need to have we need to have a you know we need to identify those problems and figure out what our goal is going to be i think the utopianistic view is a great thing to have uh in, a, in the broader sense but you can't dictate policy for the now based on that because you're not going to get there you're not going to come anywhere close to there um, and especially with the incredible level of just dogmatic brainwashing that's been going on in america these are via relationship to capitalism and and what capitalism mean, capitalism means to americans and their sense of patriotism and nationalism uh and those things should not be tied together but unfortunately they are that makes 
the idea of any kind of radical move and a move towards a even a worker-owned co-op uh, revolution that I'm kind of posing here makes that a kind of a radical move. Like people are going to be radically resilient to that. Um, so I, I, I recognize and appreciate at least the sentiment on those types of criticisms of worker-owned co-ops, but I think that they're not quite applicable in our current uh, iteration yet, just yet, current iteration of them just yet. Like we only have 500 of these damn things. Uh, but even the implementation of, of, you know, a couple thousand more would be a revolutionary process. This is why, and, and again, speaking to the idea of having this um, be a revolution born of the video game development industry, uh, I, I think that just the level, the amount of eyes that are on that industry for a variety of reasons, you've got eyes on it for you know, the big news stories of the day with... Um, Activision Blizzard and, and worker abuses and sexual assault and, you know, that happened with Riot 2. And, of course, it was EA a while ago. It all started, really, in the press with EA Spouse. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, Google EA Spouse. Their eyes on the industry for the mind-boggling amount of uh, money that the industry pulls in. Uh, you saw it in that, uh, I was going to say Mehdi Hassan, although Mehdi Hassan's pretty awesome, too. Uh, it's all these Hassans. Uh, Hassan Minaj. We saw it in that Masan Hanaj piece uh, where they were touting how much revenue the game industry pulls in. It's always stories that you see on CNBC or Fox Business or any of those other kind of, you know, money hoarding channels about how much money the game industry makes. It's a big point of interest for people, particularly people that, you know, want to make money off the stock market. Um, so it gets a lot of eyes for that reason. But then it also gets a lot of eyes just from the younger generation. Uh, well, everybody really, but particularly the younger generation and people in my demographic, the kind of the boomer ass millennials, uh, just because it's fun. We like playing video games. I mean, look at Twitch. I'm on Twitch right now. I'm about to turn around here in a few seconds. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but yeah, video games are fun. People like playing video games. Kids like playing video games. Parents like playing video games. It's a good distraction when you're playing them on your phone, if you're on a bus, or if you're in a cab or an Uber or something, or you're at a doctor's office waiting. Uh, it's fun to hop on and play online games with your friends if you've know, got nothing better to do, or you know, if you're in a lockdown and you know, you're not going to go to a pub or something. I say pub like I'm living in the UK. You're not going to go to a bar or anywhere else where you can hang out with your friends. You can get online and play some games with them. Uh, there's just a lot of eyes on the game industry and there's a lot of people like a, a big part of the reason why you know, the industry is in the condition that it's in as far as you know worker compensation and uh, worker treatment i talked about this again in that video um where we discussed uh the anime industry is there are just so many people there are so many people that want to get into the video game industry um more than anything else and they are willing to allow themselves to be exploited to whatever terrible degree that they can be exploited if that means getting their foot in the door. Um, and I understand that. I mean, I was, I mean, hey, I'm a, I'm a benefactor of one of the, of, one of, of being one of those people, right? Like, I got my foot in the door uh, putting together, physically putting together uh, casino, uh, casino games. I got hired as a tester. And I was testing the games. It was actually, you know, it was like a digital screen. I'd find bugs and all that kind of stuff. But then eventually at some point, uh, I don't know how or why, um, we were all sitting down there in like the little warehouse actually physically putting the machines together, wrapping them up and loading them onto a truck. You know, and I wasn't getting paid to be a warehouse worker, especially with like, you know how much you, know how much you can hurt yourself doing that shit? Like there's a lot of... That wasn't in my contract. My contract was to be a desk jockey, basically. But there I was, like, they, they needed help putting the machines together physically and loading them up to a truck to ship them off to casinos. And, you know, I was working my way up that ladder, getting my experience, and I did it. And as a function of that, I got hired at other game companies and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I get it. There's, there's always, like, the young, hungry kid coming out of high school or whatever that's like, a dollar fifty an hour, I'll do it, you know. And if you've got a a sea of those guys uh, waiting, you know, then yeah, that obviously that undercuts your ability to like petition for better wages or better treatment. That level of eyes on the game industry 
especially from that contingent of people that are just waiting to undercut someone. That is what makes it even more important, I think, for the game industry to take the lead on the worker-owned co-op revolution. I think that they have, they're in the perfect, I think it's the perfect environment to do it because the churn for so many companies uh, is so high and the uh, incentive uh, is already baked into to the culture of the game industry. Like everybody wants to work on their own cool thing, and that's a reason why there's a lot. That's one of the reasons why there's turnover. Obviously, you ship a game, you lay a bunch of people off. That's a reason for turnover, and you know, companies going out of business. Reason for turnover. I mean, you're upside down on your budget. You just gotta let people go. Let people go. A lot of reason for turnover in the game industry. Uh, some people just want to work on something different. They've been working on the same game for. God knows how many years so they walk and they get up and walk away, probably to some other company. But sometimes they start their own, and like that's what that's what this revolution needs to take advantage of. They need to take advantage of this huge swath of people, this huge swath of people that get affected by a high turnover. The ones that want to start their own businesses, want to start their own development studios, got to convince them to do a worker on co-op. Give them all the tools that you possibly can to make that. Uh, that transition and that that uh, the institution of that as simple as possible, and then for the people that you know don't want to just don't want to start their own thing and just want to work at somebody else's, you gotta try to connect them to these uh, worker-owned co-ops. If those co-ops are hiring, if they're trying to expand their their field, their base, uh, rather, uh, we gotta try to connect those people. There probably needs to be a hey, you know once there once there's more than like maybe three or four of these companies. Or maybe not. Maybe maybe there just needs to be it right now. Uh, some kind of you know, monster.com or indeed.com equivalent for worker-owned co-ops. Uh, whether it's game industry or not, all worker-owned co-ops. If a worker-owned co-op is hiring, then you know, maybe there is something like that. I haven't, I'll have to search for that. Maybe that already exists. Whatever the case may be, we need to invest in the tools to make this sort of thing happen. And I think the game industry is the most fertile industry for which this can be, this can be uh, seeded. It can be blossomed into something that is functional, demonstrated and proven in a real environment. And also, it's high profile. It would be cool. People would be talking about it. It'd be, in, it'd be on Polygon and Kotaku and IGN and all that kind of shit. It'd be, it'd be big news, it'd be, especially if one of those studios uh, put out a hit. I mean, it'd be big news in general, especially if it could start pulling uh, workers away from Activision and EA and all of that. It would definitely start turning some heads there. That's, that's a problem for another day. But right now, we definitely need to uh, get the ground, get the ball rolling on... on going in the game industry and we really need that we really need that act blue like uh funding mechanism for for these uh co-ops